one thing we've really looked at lately is really kind of deciding what type of operation we can have that would be the most profitable for what we're doing. Um, whether that's, you know, you always have your ideal goal. You want all your calves to wean as much as possible and all your cows to breed up as soon as they can and stay until they're 12 years old. But I think there's just some things that in certain years, you know, if bulls are really high or if pasture is really high, if you can capitalize on raising, you know, and I, I never want to say quantity over quality, but maybe marketing your open heifers at a little different time of year or selling bread heifers for a while or um, just kind of changing little things like that, being very vigilant of the markets and what opportunities are around. Um, I just think that there's a few little things like that that might make a few a difference in a few thousand bucks here and there, and that can kind of go a long way. Hey, hey, it's Shay, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, where we explore ideas, stories, and management practices to help improve beef cattle operations across the country. Now, today we are having a conversation with multiple beef producers from North Dakota, Texas, and Ohio to share what steps they have taken to work through rising input prices, and we're also going to gather their thoughts on the future of the beef industry as it relates to cattle marketing and vertical integration. Now, input costs is the top concern I hear from most of you when you engage with me on social media, so that's why we are covering it, and this is actually the first episode of a series that's going to highlight the challenges and opportunities in multiple segments of the beef industry. Now this call was actually one of my freestyle Rancher Mind events. So all the cattle producers on the call are Rancher Mind members and they are in that community. And so once a month, I have different experts on Zoom calls where cattle producers and these experts can engage. They're all producer-driven conversations. There's no slides or really traditional webinar style. It's very much just conversational about specific topics. But then once a quarter, I also do freestyle calls where it's just us members getting together and conversing as well about our top challenges that we face on our operations. So that is actually what this podcast is. It's bits and pieces, really the highlights of the conversation we had a few weeks ago. So just to give you a little highlight on the Rancher Mind program, April, May, and June are all about finding solutions to the labor challenge we face, implementing new technology on ranches, and how to become better business people in general. So if you want more information on how to have a seat at our table and converse with not only some of the best industry experts, but also fellow beef producers, head to the show notes and click on the Rancher Mind link, and that will take you to my website. And from there, you can also contact me if you have more questions. But if you're ready to sign up, heck yeah, we'd love to have you. So remember now, before we get to the show, I am doing a giveaway. So if you rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app in the month of April, I will put you in a drawing for a giveaway. But with that, let's get on with the episode and hear how fellow beef producers are currently working through rising input prices. All righty. Well, to start off because I know all of you, each person, I want you to say who you are, where you're located and describe your operation. And let's try and do this in two or three sentences so that it's brief. Cause there are a few of you. So Jared, let's start with you. My name is Jared Montford and I'm a fifth generation cow calf producer in Bridgeport, Texas, outside the DFW area. We are a fall Kevin Calcuff operation. Awesome. We're glad to have you on the call, Jared. How about the Jacobsons go? We are Casey and Jake Jacobson. We ranch by Max, North Dakota, which is near Minot. And we run commercial red Angus, sell some bread heifers, do some custom fencing in the summertime. And I help my mom, Tracy, build catalogs in the wintertime, and it's still winter here. Okay. How about Steve Best? Uh, I'm Steve Best. We farm in southeast Ohio, and uh, we run a small cow capper, primarily a stalker operation. Okay. 
and uh, the Keisters, Steve and Tracy, if one of you would share. Um, Steve and Tracy Keister, we have Keister Red Angus. We live in Steele, North Dakota. Um, we raise registered Red Angus and we calve in the fall. So we sell 18 month old bulls. Uh, Steve is currently president of Red Angus and I own Cow Camp Promotions where we do promotion for seed stock operations and some horses and even a mule catalog. <laughs> All right. So a couple of the topics that you guys brought up were input costs and then talking about urban sprawl, government regulation, um, outside factors that are influencing the beef industry and as cow-calf producers. So the topic that has really been brought up, whether that's on social media or in other conversations, um, would be rising input costs. So um, I'd just kind of like to hear each of your responses to how that has been impacting your operation. And if any of you have, what you guys have kind of been doing to find potential, potential solutions to work through that. So what about you, Casey? You were the one who kind of dropped it in the chat first. I believe you talked about feed prices in particular. Yeah, we've had kind of, I'm sure like everyone, just a few years of a few hiccups and a few droughts. And um, we put a lot of our feed up on some cropland just because we have a pretty high volume up in this area. We feed cattle for a long time. And um, I guess we've just kind of worked more. <laughs> um trying to uh, put up a little more fence and doing our best to hopefully get cattle out on grass earlier in the year, manage our rotational grazing really well in hopes to utilize our grass to the best we can and um, trying to optimize fall grazing as well. But that's kind of tough when it snows in a month earlier than you kind of want it to or expect it to. So, so yeah, I've just been trying to get as many days without running the feeder wagon as possible and trying to make it as efficient as possible. We've started feeding wet distillers just to get some higher protein and some energy, especially when those cows get closer to calving. Um, the weather doesn't cooperate. You really need some good feed sources to keep them, keep the furnace burning on those cows in the winter time. So we've just been experimenting with that and really trying to optimize every uh, pound of dry matter they intake. So you've really looked at kind of where that feed is coming from, whether that's the rotational grazing aspect or how you can adjust your ration to kind of work through some of those costs. We've done a lot of math in the wintertime. Jake mostly, he's kind of the feed guy. He just doesn't want to talk, I guess. So, <laughs> um, but just kind of figuring out what it costs per acre and per ton of dry matter to put certain feed in, like for us, we realized that it was actually more economical for us to grow more corn silage than it was for millets or hay barley, which are other feeds that we put in on cropland. And we, we still do all three, but you know, when you pay the chopping bill once a year and it's really, really high, which there's a lot of equipment involved in that, but you don't think it's really a cheap feed resource, but when you start figuring it out at a price per pound of dry matter and all your intake, input costs on it it's actually a really really economical feed to put up to a degree um so we've just done a lot of figuring out exactly what it costs per acre and per per dry matter i guess whatever it uh is easiest to calculate in but it really pays to sit down and do that math steve best what about you How have you kind of been impacted by input costs i know you're your operation is more diverse. So you might have a different take on this or a different experience. Yeah. I, I mean, we, we don't have an awful lot of control of what we have to pay for stuff. It's just kind of a decision whether you're going to use it or not. I mean, uh, we've already fertilized the spring, but uh, last year we didn't buy any fertilizer. We knew it was going to, it was going to catch up eventually, but it was just, ridiculous what they were asking for fertilizer last year and we just couldn't justify the cost so we just didn't buy it i guess that's kind of my take on it you just you either buy it or you don't you know there's not a lot of negotiating uh, try and buy as much as we can in bulk 
in volume quantities to get the price down, but we still have a whole lot of control. Absolutely. What about uh, keisters down there? Well, a little bit of what Steve said is, I guess we didn't eliminate a lot of our inputs. In fact, is I, I probably didn't eliminate any, but I cut way back on them. And, uh, and the way the kind of summer we had, I guess it was probably a pretty good move. We quit raining. So um, I agree that your, your input costs, you're kind of locked in. I mean, you're kind of at their mercy. However, for us, we have a little different scenario. I, I, we're forced to do at least a certain level of inputs, which are probably higher than a lot of other people's with our fall calving herd in North Dakota. We've found you can starve yourself into being broke too. You just have to meet at least a certain level of nutritional requirements. And, and I guess I would argue a little bit on the fertilizer concept um, we, we feel, or well, not argue, I guess just a different point of view, but we feel you have to do at least some all the time because, boy, you're going to, guy's going to get himself so far behind, you're just not going to catch up again and, and get these soil levels where they need to be to, so that when you do have a good year, you're maximizing your production. Uh, Casey brought up a point about, uh, silage. I'd maybe comment on that. It, when you figure it on dry matter, it starts to get a little high sometimes, but, but there's very few crops you're gonna put in, in my opinion, that will give you that kind of tonnage and keep the cow alive and keep her healthy and moving on. And uh, that chopping bill is astronomical, but on uh, on a tonnage as, as fed or as piled basis, it, Pretty tough to get around corn silage if you're if you're trying to keep cattle alive through the winter. It makes up for a lot of a lot of dry matter. So, I guess to put it in a nutshell, we just cut back. So, is was there anywhere you started to look first when you went to cut back? Like, what did that process look like when it was came well, time to cut back? Well, I'm glad Steve brought it up because fertilizer was a huge one. fertilizer bill. I probably cut that back. Oh, I guess I don't have the exact math, but I would say I cut it back 40% or more, maybe 50. That's where I started. Um, I maybe fed just a little bit later. I mean, there were small adjustments to the cow herd. Started feeding just a hair later uh, and fed with less valuable inputs. Just trying to keep that total overhead down, the gross overhead down. Um, Absolutely. And yeah, we put up quite a bit more poor quality hay and ground that off, blended that in. To me, it was just keeping the gross overhead down. There's just certain things you just, I feel like you just can't eliminate or or cut too far back on or it's gonna get you on your production end on the end of your uh, income. So it, it's kind of a balance. It, that's the way I look at it. Well, thank you for sharing. Has anyone seen any other solutions or you, do you have any other comments on the input cost side of things as far as, or concerns as far as the industry going forward? As far as the inputs, I think one of the things we did is we put some improvements on hold. You know, we needed to do some more fencing and, and build some more corral and we kind of put that on hold just because we knew it was gonna be a tight summer, tight year. One thing we've really looked at lately is really kind of deciding what type of operation we can have that would be the most profitable for what we're doing. Um, whether that's, you know, you always have your ideal goal. You want all your calves to wean as much as possible and all your cows to breed up as soon as they can and stay until they're 12 years old. But I think there's just some things that in certain years, you know, if bulls are really high or if pasture is really high, if you can capitalize on raising you know, and I, I never want to say quantity over quality, but maybe marketing your open heifers at a little different time of year or selling bread heifers for a while or um, just kind of changing little things like that, being very vigilant of the markets and what opportunities are around. Um, 
I just think that there's a few little things like that that might make a few a difference in a few thousand bucks here and there, and that can kind of go a long way. Um, trying to do a few different things with our cold cows, that's something that really shouldn't be overlooked ever. Those cold cows are worth, you know, when they turn into something, that can be a pretty nice profit margin for you if you really pay attention to that. And so those are just things that we've been trying to be really vigilant on um, all the time, but especially when costs are so high just to get the cattle fed and, and keep fuel in the vehicles and tractors. So, Jared, how have the rise in input costs impacted you and what are some potential solutions or changes you've made to work through that on your operation? We are primarily a Bermuda grass and native grass operation. Uh, we hay our Bermuda grass and then graze our native grasses. This is the first year that I've ever bought outside hay. We bought a little bit more native grass in hay and I bought corn stalk. I've never bought corn stalk. I've never fed corn stalk. So that was a new idea. Um, with the price of feed stuff, it was the first time that I've actually ever fed whole corn and not a, uh, a DDG type product um, to supplement cattle through the winter. And I went to a combine and picked up corn out of the combine, brought it home and fed it. Outside of feed stuff, um, we cut back on fertilizer. We pushed the limits on lime and tried to lime our fields to get our, lime, our pH of our soil back as close to neutral as we could in order to make the fertilizer that we purchased offset as far as um, efficiency of the fertilizer. So that's kind of the, some of the stuff that we've worked on this year as far as input cost. Um, we decreased some cows, sold a few cows off to get through and uh, come into this past spring about a year ago with a decreased stocking rate in order to try to survive this winter, or this summer, this past summer and this winter. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, that's right. You guys kind of went through a drought or you did go through a drought down there. So when did you um, make that decision to reduce your stocking rate? We made that, we as a fall calving program, we start breeding middle of December so we can get middle of September calves. So we made that decision at breeding time, and then we just allowed some of those cows to go ahead and uh, nurse the calves until mid-February, wean those calves a little bit early instead of calving them over or letting them stay on the cow till late March. We started weaning calves over in early February. So early February, we probably sold, <clears throat> between February and June, we sold 25% of our cow herd. Thank you for sharing that information. Hey folks, I want to take a brief break to talk about one of my favorite calving books. And you know, if you're tired of the hassle of managing your cattle records, I want to introduce you to Cattle ID because it will do the work for you. The Cattle ID platform makes it easy to store, share, and collaborate on all your herd information from your mobile device. It saves you a lot of time and effort. Plus, you get access to actionable analytics that can help you and your team make better decisions for your ranch. Don't just take my word for it. Try Cattle ID and feel the magic of hassle-free ranch management for yourself. Seriously, sign up now and see the difference it can make for you and your team. There's a link in the show notes. Alrighty, folks, so the next highlight from this call talks about vertical integration and kind of cattle marketing too, and it really just shares the thoughts and concerns about, you know, where is our industry headed? What's that going to look like? What do producers need to think about? And I really thought the people on this call had a lot of great insight, and I really appreciate them being open by sharing their concerns as well as the knowledge that I already have on the topic and I hope that you get as much out of it as I did. I really appreciated it. So with that, let's move on to the next portion of the podcast episode. In my gut, I guess I feel like they're wanting to drive us to where the poultry and the pork industry is right now. Um, I guess a good example of that we raise a few hogs and, and direct market to the consumer. And for one reason or another, we, we were short of fat hog uh, 
and we had a processing date coming up. So I, I contacted our local auction to ask them when they sold hogs and what time. They have a small ring area that's separate from the cattle ring, and that's where they normally run the, that type of animal through. And, and basically, they just asked me when I wanted it, how many, and how big. So there, there was no option on hogs. But if you wanted one, all you had to do is call the sale barn and they got it for you. So, uh, yeah, personally, I don't want to see the beef industry go in that direction uh, where we just have no negotiated trade whatsoever. You know, because that's, because that's the way it was on that hog. You know, there was no negotiation whatsoever. I told them what I wanted and they told me what it was going to cost me and I just went and picked it up. So. We're, we probably are heading to vertical integration in the beef industry, Steve. I, I think we are heading to vertical integration. I think it's going to be a little bit different than in the hog industry. You know, genetically, beef cattle are way behind the hog and poultry industry, genetically, from not just DNA, everything. Beef industry is behind. And we have a system right now where it's really based on color. I mean, we see a certain color of beef that bring way more hide color, bring way more money than others. But what's the basis behind that? Where's the economics of that? Um, if you, we did a survey at Red Angus, 250 or 80 some feeders, and it was overwhelming the feeding industry by like. 80, 90% of these respondents all said height color, while it did improve the beef industry because of the quality characteristics of the black height, helped move the beef industry up. However, 80 or 90% of them all said that is not right. We need to base this on genetics and qualify these cattle based on what genetic value they have, which we can do in the industry now. It's not hard at all. Um, but to me, I see that as, as the basis for the vertical, not just, uh, well, you use hogs, I'll use beef, not just a black steer at 800 pounds. It's going to have to be a black steer with this genetic makeup, this genetic mark, these genetic markers which we have access to all over. To me, that will be the type of vertical integration where it'll be based on what's under the hide, not the hide. Now, will that be a fixed price? I wish I had that answer for you. I, I don't see that for a while in the beef industry. I, I just don't. There's too much variation in the beef industry. Hogs are much tighter. Poultry probably much tighter yet. But is it coming? If your crystal ball has the answer, I want it. <laughs> I'll make some moves. <laughs> Jared, do you have anything to add? You've been kind of quiet over there. Well, <clears throat> to be honest, I don't know if we'll ever get cattle producers on board with that. And the reason why I'm going to say this, don't fire shots at me until you hear me out. When I read data coming from economists, we are very slow to adopt technologies. Now, granted, we have a seed stock operation. I get it. And I understand what the seed stock operations do. But the commercial cow guy doesn't follow in the same fleet footsteps. The commercial cow guy, at the average age of the commercial cow guy, they don't adopt technologies, they don't adopt changes. When we look at reproductive tools such as bull fertility, palpation for pregnancy, AI, any of those things combined, less than 35% of producers utilize one or two of those skills or technologies, so to say. So I agree that we need to get paid based upon our quality. But 
producers don't take that opportunity to find out what kind of cattle they have. And they don't work, very few cattle are DNA'd outside the seed stock. So from a commercial cow guy, I don't know if we'll ever reach that. And I'm going to make this comment, and please don't get mad at me, but the older generation has got to die off for the next generation below to start adopting these changes. So I don't know if we'll ever be where we want to be in a fully vert- vertical integrated operation until we get the younger generation to be able to have more space so at the kitchen table. Jared, I agree with you, and we deal with that. We're working on that at, daily at Red Angus, and I understand where you're coming from. And, and I'm not saying you're wrong. I actually agree with you. But what drives change in the commercial industry? What single factor drives change? I thought it was dollars, but I, I begin to wonder nowadays. If, if the commercial cow guy is still focused on dollars or if it's not just a, you hear the coffee shop talk all the time about they can't make money in the cow business. There's a lot of, be, a lot of money to be made, but you got to put forth a little bit more effort. And, and I'm not the first guy to call cattle producers lazy, but we got to put forth a little bit more effort to reach some of these benefits. Well, I, the reason I asked you that is because with, and the reason for the call was input costs. We all know they're going astronomical, or part of the reason for the call tonight, I guess, was input. Um, if these cattle that are not backed by genetic data or some type of quality data, it doesn't have to be DNA. And if we can do this off of sires and EPDs, which is the cheapest way, but Let's just use DNA. If we if they're backed by DNA markers and they bring above average, the people that keep selling at average, are they going to be in business or are they going to have to make a change? And I'm not trying to force the commercial industry into spending money. I'm not. I'm just saying. No, right. True. I'm just saying that I think this industry is going to have to shift or if we're not going to be in business. These margins are way too... I totally agree. When we look at selling cattle on the grid, we look at choice as the new norm. We've got to have higher quality carcasses. And how do we drop that down to the cow-calf guy where the cow-calf guy gets a benefit? Today, the only people that's getting a benefit is the feed yards and the packers, unless you're more vertically integrated. And the average cow herd size in the United States, I think, is 40 head. And that's not a truckload lot. So how do the guys who doesn't have a truckload lot, how do we get these guys to become cooperators with other guys close to them so they can get that truckload lot and make it work? A guy in the feed yard, he's got to sell a pen of cattle that looks all the same. And we're looking at a pen of cattle being 500 head. So how does my 40 average and your 40 average and everybody else's 40 average herd size make that pin of 500 that equal weight shape size yeah and actually that 40 head herd is 20 steers 20 heifers <laughs> valid point valid point but you know in the southeast they're starting to do a lot more of that co- co-mingling and and we've got ranchers up here that are doing that they're big outfits and well what i would call large they're three four five hundred head outfits but they're selling steers with their neighbors they all background their calves and all at once they'll go, well, you know, I've got two thirds of a load. The other neighbor says, well, you know what? I'll, I'll send the other third over on your load, send the load out. Uh, there's getting to be more and more of that because, and they're like, genetics. don't get me wrong. They're like, genetics. but uh, you're right. It, it, that's a tougher part of the, the business, but it's all doable. It's all very doable. I, I I don't think it's that hard, but maybe I'm too optimistic, I guess. I think we as beef producers want to be in control of our herd, and we don't want to give up control into a governing body called a cooperatorship in order to get a higher value. I'd be curious if Casey and Jake have 
anything to say, not forcing you to say anything, but you've been hearing a couple seed stock producers share their perspective and you guys are the commercial cattlemen on the call, you know, what kind of drives change on your operation? One thing we've looked at quite a bit, um, you, you look at all the sale reports that, you know, kind of what the very highest price cattle are bringing. And you, right now we've found that there's, there's a limit to what your steers are going to bring and what your heifers are going to bring. And you factor your input costs on that. And so you try to make money in other revenues, you know, more on your heifers, more on your cold cows, whatever that may be. And so I think for all this to happen, for us, you know, we would love to DNA our heifers and, and get more information like that. And we've received carcass data on our steers before and done our best to utilize that information. Um, but for us to put more inputs in, we're going to have to see more attainable premiums or fewer discounts, I guess you could say, on our product to sell, being our steers, whether they're ball and steers or backgrounded 45 days. Um, that's just one thing that we've kind of kind of just realized is, you know, there's there's a limit at what those are worth right now and what's attainable for us to achieve. We live a long ways from a feed yard. And so if we were to retain ownership on something, it would be a relationship with a total stranger, which might be just fine. But when it's that much of your income, it's something you kind of don't take lightly. Um, so it's stuff we've kicked around and we'd like to be as progressive as possible, but, um, like everybody said, inputs are high and, and it's just, um, something you have to weigh all the inputs and output costs on. Casey brought up a point that I think scares a lot of, a lot of people in our industry. And, and it actually, it scares me. Are we looking for a premium or are we looking for less deduction? And unfortunately, I really think reality says we need to be looking for less deductions. Uh, I mean, Jared mentioned it too, that we need, we're going to have to be able to quantify these cattle. I think the cattle that are not quantified in some way, shape, or form, whether that's their, they're verified by the genetics or sired by, either through PPDs, or they're verified through genomic testing, or, and, and you don't have, I'll throw this out there, a lot of people panic when they say genetically verified. They think, oh my gosh, I got a DNA every animal I'm trying to sell. No, you don't. You, you can do as little as 30% of your replacement females, which are full sieves to the steers you're selling, that gives that feeder a very good idea of what them cattle are going to do. Uh, I have the documentation on it. I can get Shay if she wants to send it out to you guys. If you're interested. We ran multiple trials on this and it, and it matches up very, very well. You can say you pick, you retain 30, 40% of your female. DNA them, you don't have DNA in all of them. DNA your replacement heifers, that tells you very closely how them steers are going to do in the feed yard from an efficiency standpoint and the quality standpoint. Uh, it's just something to remember rather than panic and on, on verifying cattle. It, it, it's not that bad. I mean, it's, it's an expense. I'm not going to argue that at all, but there's economical ways to do it. And it doesn't have to just be DNA. Steve, I'm not disagreeing at all with what you're saying, but where we're at, and Jared, I guess we're trying to we're kind of filling that niche that you talk about where you've got these small producers that don't have load lots. That that's the niche that we've found to be successful at is buying those calves off those guys that are similar size and color um, and putting them in the load lots and, and backgrounding them up to about 800 pounds seems to be working for us um, but I'm, steve i'm having a heck of time getting guys just to castrate let alone do dna testing um so i, I think we're, we're going to lose an awful lot of producers 
and, and a lot of them are going to be older. Jared, to your, to your, they're, they're not going to necessarily die off, but I, I think if we start putting more requirements on them to be able to sell their calves, some of these old boys just ain't going to do it. <laughs> you know, we're, we're kind of a tenacious bunch, and that's what keeps us as cattle producers. Um, but they're, they're just not going to stand for somebody telling them what genetics they need to use, and, and you know, they're just, they're just going to get out. In my opinion. Does anyone else have any parting thoughts before we wrap up today? I guess for other cow calf producers, I would really encourage them to evaluate options for marketing. You know, a lot of people, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with this. You take your steers to the same barn on either this week or this week, and and that's what you do because that's what your feed resources allow, and and what. Um, what you've always done and, and what works best potentially, but we've done some things in the past few years, trying different direct trade options or video auctions or switching barns and, and some have worked and some haven't, but it's just a method for you to try and take more control over um, marketing your entire calf crop. You know, that's something that you really shouldn't take lightly and not it won't work every time to change something and it's not good to change all the time but i think it's really important to keep those options open because sometimes when it doesn't rain for a long time and, and your feed resources have changed you can adapt more quickly if you've stayed up to date on those various options we as producers have to take control of how we mark our cattle if we get sick of the cell phone and let them do the marketing or sometimes i feel like they don't have our best interest at heart I feel like we have to take control of our market and we have to be in the driver's seat of the marketing plan of our cattle. And that has to be nearly as much thought out before we look at mating decisions or breeding decisions or feed input costs or any other input costs. Is what are you going to get on the back side when you go to market those cattle? All righty. Well, thank you all for attending the Rancher Mind freestyle event tonight. And, uh, Bring to turn this into a podcast. And that's a wrap on that one. So remember, folks, if you want to have conversations like these, as well as more guided conversations with industry experts about topics such as labor challenges, becoming better business managers, what types of technology to implement on your operation, and how do you know when to do that, be sure to check out the Rancher Mind link in the show notes or get a hold of me on my website. There's a contact page and you can send that'll go straight to my email so you can message me there. But with that, have a great day.